Fundamentally, global trade is a mismatch between the production and consumption decisions around the world. One way to think about that practically is that it makes sense to specialize in produ producing cars in certain parts of Germany to take advantage of economies of scale and to ship them to other countries like France, which are excellent at producing, uh, which is excellent at producing agricultural crops. And so you get deals essentially, crops for cars, and that deal fundamentally underpinned what became the European Union. And so this is a way in which trade essentially helps bring together customers' needs and the location of producers and enables producers not to be located right next door to their customers. Countries don't develop industries in, uh, in every sector for, the, for several reasons. First, they may not have the resources. Switzerland does not have oil. And they may not have the expertise. They may have experts, say, in producing cars or woods craftsmen, but not necessarily in silk production, in which case it makes sense to produce what you're relatively better at. So specialization happens for very good reasons, and uh, specialization doesn't necessarily have to follow national borders. It's true that trade is essentially amounts to sales between firms and customers who may be located in different countries, uh, but governments take a view that the outcome of those transactions is something they want to influence maybe for defensive and offensive reasons. The defensive reasons is when an industry comes under pressure normally from imports and there's a potential for job loss. Governments, for better or for worse, feel that they often have to defend their local industries under these cases using tariffs and quotas. The offensive reasons typically are associated with trying to develop new industries. A very good example is the current China 2025 policy, which seeks to promote 10 major sectors in the Chinese economy over the next eight years. And here, discriminating against foreign firms in lots of subtle ways is often part of that package of industrial policy. Trade agreements are very important for consumers for two reasons. They help lower prices and they expand substantially the uh, choice which is available. Anyone who's been on holiday to a small Caribbean island which is fairly cut off from the world trading system will have been into shops where you see that the choice is substantially reduced, maybe one or two breakfast cereals rather than choosing between 20 or 30 that you might see in a supermarket here in Switzerland. This variety is, uh, effect is actually substantial in terms of improving people's livelihoods and probably as important as the lower prices which are driven by global trade. Whether there's a downside to trade agreements depends very much what's in those trade agreements. And some provisions of them are exceptionally controversial. Some people think that the trade agreement provisions which protect intellectual property go, to, uh, go too far. Others don't think they go far enough. And it's in areas where you get away from traditional trade into, regu uh, into rules on regulations like domestic regulations that trade policy gets very controversial. Global trade enables specialization within the global economy. So it's, it's hard to conceive of one developing without the other, uh, ha without there being implications for the other. Global trade provides opportunities for firms to expand sales, and this could be good for exports and domestic growth. Um, and also, as global trade evolves over time, firms may decide to re relocate uh, production or to develop new industries in different places. And so firms take advantage of an open global economy to help strengthen their own performance as well. And this often has knock-on effects for different economies as well. The America First policy and Brexit represent two profound shocks to a, a trend of greater openness of the world economy. Uh, Brexit is the first time we've seen a major international trade agreement be repudiated by a large trading nation in, in recent times. Uh, this will, I think, have profound implications for the future trajectory of the European Union as well as what the United Kingdom's trade policies will be. America First uh, represents a, a further acceleration of nationalistic trade policy in the United States. It's not, um, the Trump administration has articulated a particularly aggressively nationalistic tone uh, favoring certain U.S. industries, mainly manufacturing industries, over uh, foreign commercial interests. And uh, the consequences of this are, are still to be seen. Uh, at the moment, it looks like uh, the bark is worse than the bite. One downside of the American First policy is that it seeks to put tariffs on commodities which are often used in the production of other goods and services. In a very tangible way, think about steel. There's a proposal to put tariffs on imported steel into the United States. It turns out that those uh, tariffs would actually raise the cost of every industry in the US which uses steel. 
and would undermine their export competitiveness on world markets. And so what you see in the steel case is adverse knock-on consequences for U.S. Uh, performance in the global economy from a defensive nationalistic policy. And this is why you're, a lot of pressure is being exercised in Washington to ensure that those tariffs are either kept to the lowest possible level or not implemented at all.